hope y'all talk to you soon. Look, look Buzz, look at me. That cute smile. How does Alec Murdoch, a self-proclaimed loving father and husband... Hey, Buzz! <laughs> would you see Alec show his display of affection and love to Maggie and to Paul and Buster? Yes, sir. Become their executioner. Police are here now. Police are here now. Alec Murdoch is facing four charges, two murder charges and two gun charges related to the deaths. This was the act of a desperate man. <laughs> He goes from just a normal, everyday dad, laughing with his wife and son, to a, a cold-blooded murderer. Wah, 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 wah. Maybe he just snapped. But still, it was hard to grasp a parent doing this to their child. He's torn down an entire legacy, a law firm. I'm mad as hell. No one, no matter how close they thought they were, and so many people did think they were close to Alec Murdoch, nobody knew who he really was. And if Alec's life has been a lie... What happened? I got shot. Does his family even know him? It was all a lie. And he lied to you? He did. Alec's only living child, Buster, tells his side of the story in an exclusive interview. How did that make you feel? It made me feel horrible. And what made me feel even worse was what he was actually trying to do. I have always known I hurt people I truly love. And for the first time, Alec Murdoch reads excerpts from a journal he says he kept during the trial. I am convinced more than ever that if I had not lied, I would not be here. When I look up the definition of, of psychopath, like someone who can completely get away with lying and acting normal and carrying through as if nothing's happening. Does that describe your dad when you look at those definitions of that? I'm not prepared to sit here and say that it encompasses him as a whole, but certainly I think there are characteristics where you look at the manipulation and the lies and the carrying out of that such, and I, I think that's a fair assessment. If I were a betting person, I'd say there may be one more twist or one more turn in the Murdoch saga. Mr. Murdoch, do you hope to testify this week? Where were you the night that Stephen Smith was killed? Those who know, know. And those who don't know, just make things up. Stop, take your time. In the early morning after the murders, SLED investigators interview Alec. I was at the house. I left the house and went to my mom's. <sighs> he claims he was never at the Moselle Kennels. Maggie's a dog lover. Okay. She fools with the dogs. And I knew she'd gone to the kennel. But a video recorded that night exposes the truth. Very big moments in court today. Cell phones took center stage in the Collinson County courtroom. It was around March of 2022, I believe, where they were able to crack into Paul's phone. And this is, what, nine months after the murders occurred, and they were able to find a video several moments before the murders. Quick, Cash. Come here, Cash. Post it. Cash. On the video, we hear Maggie's voice and Paul's voice, and then someone we don't expect to hear. This is a chicken. Come here, Bob. Come here, Cash. Come here, Bob. Cash. Quick. Whose voices did you recognize on that video? Uh, Paul Murdahl, Maggie Murdahl, and Alex Murdahl. And how sure are you? 100%. So that became huge. We had Alec at the scene with the victims just moments before they died, and he had been lying about it. Your dad had told you that he 
didn't go down to the kennel that night. That's right. He told everybody that. You went to the scene where Alec was, is that right? I did. And did he deny ever going down to those kennels to his buddy and law partner of 34 years? He said that he ate dinner, laid down on the couch, took a nap, and then left. And now you know that's not true from seeing the kennel video, right? I do. So when you discovered that he had lied about that, what'd you think? I thought it was very odd. I was confused. I didn't know why you would lie about such a thing. Why do you think he did? I, I don't know. I'd still like to understand, you know, why that was, you know, needed to be lied about. Why do people lie? People lie because they knew they did something wrong and they're trying to avoid accountability. Now, clearly, he lied about where he was, but you can hear uh, Alec and Maggie in the background. Hey, he's got a bird in his mouth. Blah, blah, blah. The tone is very convivial. Um, they're almost laughing about it. According to the state's theory, um, within that, that just that few minutes, he goes from just a normal everyday dad laughing with his, his wife and son to a, a cold-blooded murderer. <laughs> I don't understand fully how he could lie about that. What else is he lying about? I am convinced more than ever that if I had not lied, I would not be here. I have always known how badly I hurt people I truly love. All right, that's the end of that. Were you concerned about his lie in the courtroom? Yeah, most definitely. When the kennel video surfaced in the trial, I think that you have to get up there and you have to say to the jury what made you lie. And that was very, very important. Well, Alec Murdoch testify in his own double murder trial. We asked the disbarred attorney about his plans as he entered the courthouse this morning. Mr. Murdoch, do you hope to testify this week? Have you made up your mind yet? It was a high stakes thing either way, but the kennel video kind of forced him to take the stand, I think. He had to explain why he hadn't told the truth. Uh, Mr. Murdoch, if you'll come forward. Anytime you put the accused on the witness stand, there is substantial danger, but the cat was out of the bag, and it was a bad cat. Uh, Mr. Murdoch, have you made a decision as to whether you're going to testify? Yes, sir. And what is your decision? I am going to testify. I want to testify. All right, very well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. We swear or affirm that the testimony you give today will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Were you, in fact, at the kennels at 8.44 p.m. on the night Maggie and Paul were murdered? I was. I think people were surprised when Alec took the stand. But he was probably thinking, you know what, I'm still Alec Murdoch. I know my way around a courtroom. These are my people. Alec, why did you lie about the last time you saw Maggie and Paul? As my addiction evolved over time, I would get in these situations or circumstances where I would get paranoid. Now, what type of addiction are you referring to? My, my addiction is to, is to opiate painkillers. And um, that night, June 7th, I'm sitting in a police car with David Owen asking me about my relationship with my wife and my son. And all those things caused me to have paranoid thoughts. And I lied about being down there. He says he was having this paranoia the night of the murder. So, but then he, can, he had more interviews with law enforcement where he lies again. <laughs> How long was he planning to continue the lie? And I believe he was gonna continue the lie forever if this video did not emerge. Did you continue lying after that night, did you not? But once I lied, I continued to lie, yes, sir. Why? You know, oh, what a tangled web we weave. 
Tell me what was going on from where you were sitting watching that play out. Nobody wants to be sitting in the sixth row of the Colleton County Courthouse, you know, been there for four and a half weeks of a murder trial that your father is accused of killing your mom and brother, and now all of a sudden you need to watch him defend his innocence. During approximately 10 hours of testimony over the course of two days, Alec Murdoch confronts his many lies and misdeeds. You agree that the most important part of your testimony here today is explaining your lie for a year and a half that you were never down at those kennels at 844. I agree that is an important component. All right. And what was the discussion? You said that they were going down there, but you didn't want to go. Is that right? I wasn't going to go. I said, I'm not going to go. So why'd you change your mind? Because Maggie wanted me to. You pulled up, you get out of the, the, uh, the golf cart? Uh, when I, no, when I pulled up, I stayed on the golf cart. Stayed on the golf cart. How long did you stay on the golf cart? <laughs> However long I was down there. And what did you do after that? I left. You left. Are these convenient facts in your new story that have to fit with the timeline now that that evidence has been thrown in your face? No, sir. Once he made the decision to testify, he was not going to get off the stand easy. How many, uh, how many pills were you using a day? Anywhere from uh, 1,500 milligrams, maybe, to more than 2,000 milligrams a day. So you're taking 60 a day or something like that? I mean, there I were days where I took more than that. And I was an addict for more than 20 years. I don't know if he was really taking 60 pills a day and walking around acting otherwise normal and functioning. Alec taking that many pills in X amount of years, if you do the math after a couple hours, that would have been a lethal amount of oxy. Your mom and Paul were very concerned about your dad's drug use. Did Paul mention that to you? Yeah, so there were times where they mentioned it to me. It would be a, a little bit of a scenario of maybe they discovered like pills or found pills, but never in my wildest imagination could I think like, oh man, this is, I mean, this guy's battling a 20 year opiate addiction where he's taking, you know, however many um, pills a day. So when did you start stealing money from clients? How long did it take? before you started doing that? I'm not sure when the first time I did that is. Alec claims his addiction not only caused him to lie, it forced him to steal millions of dollars to fund his opioid habit. Let's we'll start with Natasha Thomas. Do you remember her? I do. She was underage, correct? Uh, yes, she was underage. I do believe that. Right. So you got $800,000 attributed to you with the firm, but that was not enough. You also stole money from that teenager. Is that correct? That is correct. He'd been stealing money for years, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars. No one had found him because he was able to stay one, two, and three steps ahead of everybody. Well, tell me about Miss Malley. So she lost her daughter, correct? That is correct. Very, very sweet lady, correct? Very sweet lady. All right, and you stole all of the money, didn't you? I, I don't dispute that. But you don't really understand what the potential destruction of a legacy and of a life that Alec is facing until you understand all that he's been doing, all the years and years of alleged misappropriations and thefts. And this was as tangled a web as I think anyone has ever seen. Alec doesn't just steal money from clients. He even targets people who were close to him, like the sons of his beloved housekeeper, Gloria Satterfield. Do you remember looking Tony Satterfield in the eye? and lying to him. Yeah. He was the son of your longtime housekeeper, Gloria, who had served your family for many years, and you stole millions from those boys. I, I stole those funds. I hate that I did it. I'm embarrassed for my son. And what was your response when you heard that he was stealing $3.8 million from the Satterfield family? So it was all, I mean, you know, obviously I had been privy to the information, like I knew there were financial wrongdoings, but I mean, yeah, to get the details and to get the understanding of who he took money from is heartbreaking. These are all real people, yes or no? They're all real people, 
And a lot of them are people that I love. Yes, you hurt the people that you love, I know. It became a case more about the accused being a liar and a thief than it became about being a murderer. Alec Murdoch, by any account, is a bad person. But that is not what he was on trial for. Nevertheless, the state continues to shine a light on Alec's financial misdeeds and the upcoming $10 million civil lawsuit for the 2019 boat crash that killed Mallory Beach. Mark Tinsley made it very clear to Alec, you're going to have to pay, and you're going to have to pay a lot of money. And Alec's defense team says, Alec can't do that. You had uh, been told by the defense, essentially, that Alec had no money, correct? He's broke. Right. Did they say he could cobble together a certain amount? I thought he could cobble together a million dollars. A million dollars. Did you believe that that was accurate? It couldn't have been. And that's when Mark Tinsley said, OK, fine, then show me the books, show me his finances. And that was one of the big issues on the table for the June 10th hearing in the boat case. In the weeks leading up to the murders on June 7th, 2021, Alec Murdoch is facing a civil lawsuit hearing that may force him to expose his personal finances. The boat accident was putting financial pressure on him that his finances were gonna to come to light. I believe the Beach family lawsuit against Alec Murdoch and all those other parties contributed to his fear of being exposed for stealing money from the firm and from clients. Were you concerned that your house, financial house, was going to be opened up for the world as a result of that hearing? No. I personally have never been able to get a judge to order the kind of information that Mark Tinsley was saying he was seeking. Yeah, the, the boat crash was, um, was definitely a grenade pen um, that set lots of things into motion. On the day of the murders, the CFO of the Murdoch Law Firm testified she had gotten suspicious about like missing fees and just some financial irregularities, and she came to Alec. You asked him for proof, is that correct? Yes. He assured me that the money was over there and that he'd get the records or they would get everything that we needed. What was your concern then, back at that point in time, on June 7th? that he was trying to hide income from the boat wreck. And that is hiding assets. And we're not going to be part of any wrongdoing. That's a very significant confrontation that that's going on. He's being asked, show me where those fees are, because I think you took them. The prosecution argues that that confrontation motivates Alec to murder his wife and son. Now, he is a victim, a grieving father, a grieving husband. Murdering his wife and son was the horrible, dramatic price that he was willing to pay. This motive of he got questioned about stealing $750,000 that day and went home and killed his wife and son to distract attention from this thievery is the worst malarkey I've ever heard in my life. How does that, in anybody's mind, justify him going home and executing the love of his wife and the, the, the apple of his eye. After the murders happened, was anybody at all concerned about getting the proof? We weren't going to go in there and harass him about money when we were worried about his mental state and the fact that this, his family had been killed. Um, it just wasn't even on our mind at that point. He's on the cusp of facing financial ruin, legal ruin, and all those inquiries that people were making, all those things that were coming to a head, they immediately stopped. When you were facing accountability, suddenly you became a victim and everyone ran to your aid. Isn't that true? There were no accountability issues on my doorstep on June the 7th. That's what you say, not what other people say. To me, that made no sense at all. Like. Killing two people would clearly bring more attention to his life, his finances. It wouldn't distract from any of it. The prosecution's theory that playing the victim to get sympathy is all part of Alec Murdoch's M.O. is demonstrated again in September of 2021, just three months after the murders.
in the aftermath of the murders. You get confronted about your thefts from the law firm, correct? No wiggling out of this one, correct? I didn't try to wiggle out of this one. Things took a very bad turn for Alec on September 3rd, 2021, when the partners at his law firm basically approached him with a lot of irregularities and they made him resign. Just when we thought it couldn't get any crazier, then there's this Labor Day shooting incident where he claims he was fixing a flat tire and that somebody came and tried to kill him. What happened? I got shot. And then it came out, well, in fact, it was all a setup that he had gotten in touch with a remote relative and friend, and he hired Curtis Smith to shoot him in the road so Buster, his sole surviving son, would get a life insurance policy. We saw the symmetry between, wait a minute, Alec is facing accountability again, and guess what? Now he's suddenly the victim of the side of the road, and everybody's rushing to his aid again, just like what happened um, you know, with the murders. But we knew that there was something here. Again, the motive, the means, the opportunity, and the acts of a guilty person, they're all there with Alec. The lie that you told of an unknown assailant was to try to make people think that the, quote, real guy, bad guys, were back again to finish the job. Isn't that true? No, sir, that's not true. That's not the effect that you intended that story to have? Well, that's, that's the story that you told. That is the story I told. But that's because the man who shot me did not shoot me that day as I intended. And I had, a, I had to have a story as to how I got shot, so I lied. Whatever his motivations were, he was using lies to cover his trail until he couldn't any longer. This was the act of a desperate man that had nothing to do with the murder wasn't relevant to the murder. It was about the financial house crumbling. Did you ask him to shoot you as a sympathy ploy? I meant for him to shoot me so I'd be gone. And why did you want to be gone? I mean, I knew all this was coming to a head. I knew how humiliating it was going to be for my son. I mean, I'd been through so much. At the time, in the bad place that I was, it seemed like a better thing to do. How did that make you feel? It made me feel horrible. And what made me feel even worse was what he was actually trying to do. And to understand that he thought that that was going to be some kind of benefit, giving all the things that I had gone through prior, you know, disappointed me. And, you know, I, I told him, he was like, I mean, you should know that, that this is not the way to handle it. This is not what I needed. You know, I needed, I needed you here, not, you know, a, a temp, a, attempting some kind of suicide stunt. So what can we believe from Alec Murdoch now? I mean, he's just digging his hole deeper and deeper. What in the world is he doing? Alec admits to a litany of lies. But the biggest is that he isn't at the kennels moments before Maggie and Paul's phones go silent at 8.49, which the prosecution says gives him 17 minutes to kill them and leave Moselle at 9.06. The timeline is very, very key, and it damns Alex. Paul and Maggie are murdered sometime during the 849 minute. And then at 906, Alex gets in the car to drive to Almeida where his mother is. Under the attorney general's theory, he would have had to have killed Maggie, killed Paul, close to 850. And their expert and our expert said whoever shot Paul would be covered in blood head to foot. So the question is, what happened to all of that blood? Sled didn't do its job, and the best evidence of this fumbling the ball was this T-shirt that had a pattern of something which would be consistent with blood spatter. Blood spatter on Alex's shirt was a significant piece of evidence the state needed to bring him to trial for murder. The cornerstone that they went to the grand jury on wasn't true. We got a trial date set, and then they found out it wasn't human blood. That just shows there was no forensic evidence tying him to the murder. 
it's very clear that Alec uh, took off whatever he was wearing and rinsed off. I mean, he's down there at the kennels where you've got that, uh, that hose in a very, very bloody scene. What were you doing? What I wasn't doing is doing anything, uh, as I believe you've implied, that I was cleaning off or washing off. And I can promise you that I wasn't doing any of that. He apparently becomes a low country John Wick with lots of activity, killing and cleaning off. What still amazes me is you know, he's killed these two people in a very bloody, violent fashion, very close quarters with his son, but didn't get any blood on him. He's completely clean. So we had less than 17 minutes to get in like the golf cart, go back up to the main house, dispose of the weapons, dispose of the bloody clothes, put himself in new clothes, and get into his car and leave. How can you do that in 17 minutes? You know how hard it is to wash blood off? It is very hard. And there's no way to where you're gonna wash it off in no 10 to 15 minutes and do a good job. He either changed shirts or he had on a barrier between he and the business end, the muzzle end of that shotgun. Well, maybe he was wearing some sort of coverall or some, some reason that he was able to very quickly get cleaned up. Did you get high velocity blood spatter from being within a distance of a shooting, Maggie or Paul? There's no way that I had high velocity blood spatter on me. They tried to come up with a suggestion without any evidence that he hosed himself off with the water hose that was that of the dog kennel. But there's no evidence whatsoever. And again, no forensic evidence. There was any blood in any water. They never swabbed the, the sinks to see if there's blood in the sinks, DNA in the sinks. They were giving them a lot of, you know, a lot of courtesies. It just shows the, the privilege that the Murdochs had and how law enforcement treated them the way they wouldn't treat anybody else. It was, you know, it was all privilege and power. The sad situation is it was to Alex's disadvantage that they didn't go by the book and search thoroughly. And we believe those opportunities that they missed would have or could have exonerated Alex. Without that physical evidence, the prosecution focuses on digital data from that critical time period. Alex's phone is showing no activity uh, from the early part of the 8 o'clock hour until 9.02. The fact that he didn't take his phone down to the kennels is very telling. He left the phone at the house and he personally went down so that it, it couldn't be tracked uh, for his actual whereabouts. Let me ask you this, Mr. Murdoch. Did you take your phone with you down to the kennels, according to the new facts that you're testified to yesterday and today? I must not have. You must not have? If this is accurate, no, sir. Is that typical for you? Sure it is, it's absolutely. Typical. His phone doesn't move once until 9.02. In between 9.02 and 9.06, his phone takes over 280-something steps. What is he doing during that four minute period? He's running around the house doing something. What were you doing, Mr. Murdoch, for those four months? Preparing to leave for my mom's house. Well, the real reason, Mr. Murdoch, is that you as a lawyer and prosecutor are up at 902, finally having your phone in your hand, moving around and making all these phone calls to manufacture an alibi. Is that not true? It's absolutely incorrect. I never manufactured any alibi in any way, shape, or form. Maybe he was stepping while he was talking on the phone. Maybe he was pacing. I could think of other explanations for like taking a lot of steps um, that didn't seem that incriminating. Alec gets in the Suburban around 906. Though he's called Maggie multiple times, uh, he does not drive down to the kennels or say, hey guys, I'm heading over to Alameda. What's going on? Why aren't you answering the phone? Doesn't do any of that. You're obviously wanting to get in touch with him. Why didn't you go down to the kennels that were so close by? It wasn't important to do that. Me, me making those phone calls is simply me letting them know that I'm leaving for a minute, I'll be back. And as far as not going down there, 
there, there was no sense of urgency. Maggie was with Paul. You know, she should be as safe as she could be. And so as you're listening to them talk about these, these timelines and break it all down, did you second guess your belief that it was somebody from the outside? I still stand with my opinion and I, you know, I don't, you know, I just think it still was somebody from the outside. And there's no evidence as to who these people might be? I mean, not as that have been found yet. Mr. Murdy, did you take this gun or any gun like it and blow your son's brains out? No, I did not. Did you fire it into your wife Maggie's leg, torso, or any part of her body? No, I did not. Mr. Murdoch, are you a family annihilator? A family annihilator? You mean like, did I shoot my wife and my son? Yes. No. Would never hurt Maggie Murdoch. I would never hurt Paul Murdoch. Under any circumstances. No idea how I did because I can't talk to Jim or Dick. But it seemed like a number of jurors were very responsive. I believe the jury is definitely the only chance I have at a fair trial. I am absolutely exhausted. The trial for the murders of Maggie and Paul Murdoch was expected to last three weeks, but it stretches on for six, making it the longest and most sensational criminal trial in South Carolina history. And now it's time for closing arguments. First, by the state, Mr. Waters. Good morning. In his closing argument, lead prosecutor Creighton Waters is out to demonstrate that even with all the privilege that came with the Murdoch name, no one is above the law. On June 7th, 2021, at the Moselle property in Colleton <laughs> County, Maggie Murdoch and Paul Murdoch were brutally and maliciously murdered at the kennels by Alec Murdoch. And after an exhaustive investigation, there is only one person who had the motive, who had the means, who had the opportunity to commit these crimes, and also whose guilty conduct after these crimes betrays him. The defendant is the person on which a storm was descending, and the defendant is a person where his own storm would actually mean consequences for Maggie and Paul. He'd avoided accountability his whole life. He had relied on his family name. But now finally, he was facing complete ruin. The entire illusion of his life was about to be altered. He couldn't live for that. He has fooled everyone, everyone who thought they were close to him. And he fooled Maggie and Paul too. And they paid for it with their lives. Don't let him fool you too. This is Wednesday, March the 1st. It makes me nervous that the jury is going to sleep on what the state said. But at least Jim gets all night to prepare his reply to what he said. The next day, the defense makes the case that although he admits to being a liar, Alec Murdoch isn't lying about the one thing that matters most murdering his wife, Maggie, and his son, Paul. Good morning. Closing arguments will be very important. It's an opportunity to tie all the loose ends together and, and summarize and crystallize to the jury that Alec did not kill Maggie and Paul. Alex lied about being down in the kennels. And, and why did he lie? 
And that is certainly a fair question. And, and, and frankly, I probably wouldn't be sitting over there right now if he had not lied. But he did lie. And he told you he lied. And he lied because that's what addicts do. Addicts lie. You've heard testimony from a, a lot of witnesses who actually knew Alec and Maggie and Paul and Buster testified under oath how much Alec adored Maggie. That was, she was his all. Some people describe Paul as Alec's best friend. His relationship with them was awesome. And that was unanimous. When you get this case, you'll be making one of the most consequential decisions that you will have ever made in your life. If there's any reasonable cause for you to hesitate to write guilty, then the law requires you to write not guilty. On behalf of Alex, on behalf of Buster, on behalf of Maggie, and on behalf of my friend Paul, I respectfully request that you do not compound a family tragedy with another. Thank you. I'm so ready for this to be over, but obviously I'm very nervous. It's always hard waiting on a jury. I'm sure it will be twice as hard from a cell. The Fox News alert, a verdict has been reached in the trial of South Carolina attorney Alex Murdoch. It's a good sign when they come back that quickly, but I wasn't ready to believe yet. Be seated. I understand that there is a verdict you may bring the jury. To me, the biggest surprise of the trial was how quickly the jury came to its decision. And the whole time I was watching the trial, I was thinking like, this is a lot of complicated evidence it's gonna take a while to kind of sort through all of this. And three hours didn't seem to be enough time in the jury's deliberations to, to do all of that. Thank you. Uh, Madam Forlady, if you'll stand for me. Uh, have you reached a verdict? Yes, yes, sir, we have. When you have a favorable verdict, jurors sometimes will smile at you, nod at you. So we had an early verdict come back, and we had no one looking at us. Defendant will rise. Madam Clerk, you may publish the verdict. I'm the one that read the verdict of Alec Murdoch. And I was a little, um, my breath was knocked out for a moment. But then I have to tell myself that to treat this just like any other trial, any other verdict that I have to read. And I have to place my mind there and take out any other personal um, relationships. The state versus Richard Alexander Murdoch defendant, indictment for murder, guilty verdict. You could hear a pin drop. Um, I don't think there are a lot of people, especially in the community, I don't think they thought that the jury was going to, to come back that fast with a guilty verdict. Alec Murdoch had no reaction at all during the reading of the verdicts. There were so many reactions from so many others. Did you cry? You know, I don't like to do that thing in the front of a camera. I don't think anybody would. Um, but yeah, I mean, you are going through a tremendous emotional time. It's an absolutely excruciatingly difficult experience. Wow, what a great day for the people of South Carolina. Once the jury heard about the despicable things he had done stealing the money, they were ready to convict him of anything and everything. I came to this not expecting anybody to listen to anything. I am not here 
because of what the jury just convicted me of. I am in this because of pills, stealing, and lying. Because I would never, under any circumstances, hurt Maggie or Papa. I'm trying to keep positive and remember that this is part of my journey. When you look back at this trial, they didn't find a murder weapon. They didn't find any bloody clothing. There were no witnesses. A lot of digital evidence. Yeah, crappy motive. You think it was a crappy motive. And yet, 12 jurors all agreed that your dad killed your mom and Paul. That's right. What do you think about that? I do not believe it was fair. Why? I was there for six weeks studying it, and I think it was a, a tilted table from the beginning. And I think, unfortunately, a lot of the jurors felt that way prior to when they had to deliberate. It was predetermined in their minds prior to when they ever heard any shred of evidence that was given in that room. Why would the jurors be inclined to go against your dad? Because of everything they had the ability to read prior to the trial. I think that people get overwhelmed, and I think that they believe everything that they read, and I think it took advantage of a, a jury pool in a very small town, in a very small county. In this particular case, the Alec Murdoch case, we could go to Ohio and pick a jury and probably have almost as many people know about it. Um, we can't change the reality of the modern media landscape. So all you can do is go and, and have your jury selection process and rely on people to do what they swear they're gonna do when they take their oath as jurors. And it was a tough case, but they honored that oath. Joining us now are jurors James McDowell, Gwen Jennerette, and Amy Williams. Good morning to all of you. Good morning. Good morning. Four days after the verdict, three of the jurors appeared on the Today Show to explain why they convicted Alec Murdoch. Well, first of all, I couldn't believe that he was taking the sand. And when he got on the sand, I was like, okay. So it was him, you know. I don't know him, so I never, you know, knew his voice, but I realized it was him. And in a kennel video, that just kind of sealed the deal. If you really think about what the jury was dealing with, this story went international. Everybody was watching the story. And when the jury came back that fast, I think they didn't want to be part of what people thought this area was like. I think they thought, we need to clean house, the guy's guilty, come back, done and dusted, goodbye. The day after the verdict, now in his prison uniform, Alec Murdoch arrives at the courthouse to be sentenced. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning. Anything further? I don't think further comment is necessary, Your Honor. Thank right. you. Mr. Murdoff, you'll come to the court for sentencing. I do not want anyone speaking on my behalf this morning. Number one, it would be too hard on them. Number two, it would be an absolute and complete waste of time, as I know the judge has his mind made up. We didn't want to pursue the death penalty. The death penalty adds a whole layer of logistics, a whole layer of cost. It would double the cost of the trial and possibly double the length of the trial. I know you have to see Paul and Maggie during the night times when you're attempting to go to sleep. I'm sure they come and visit you. All day and every night. I'm sure. And they will continue to do so. Good, I tell you again, I respect this court, but I'm innocent. Well, it, and it might not have been you. It, it might have been uh, the monster you become when you take opioid pills. Maybe you become another person. We'll leave that at that. All right, Mr. Murdoch, I sentence you to the State Department of Corrections on each of the murder indictments in the murder of your wife, Maggie Murdoch. I sentence you for the term of the rest of your natural life. 
for the murder of Paul Murda, whom you probably love so much. I sentence you to prison for murdering him for the rest of your natural life. will be glad to see me back in chains. I will keep my head high and shoulders back. I refuse to give him the satisfaction. For the sentencing, Judge Newman spoke and he said, said, I'm sure Maggie and Paul visit you every night when you're trying to go to sleep. And your dad said every day and every night. Did you think the judge was going too far? Yeah, I think that's just another one of his clever little lines to suggest that he agrees with the guilty verdict. I think he was very straightforward about that. And I think it was just a kind of a cruel analogy um, to be throwing out amongst a, a, a just an overly public trial. With the guilty verdict and sentencing handed down, Alec Murdoch's lawyers continue to fight on his behalf. You know, I'm sorry for our client, but we're not going to give up. We're going to go forward with an appeal. And if we get a, a new trial, I'll be right there doing it. Absolutely, they're going to appeal it. I mean, the defense has to appeal everything. But we believe it is sound, and we believe that the verdict will be upheld. Obviously, the admission of the financial evidence is going to be a, a key issue. We knew that. But I think uh, Judge Newman, you know, very carefully uh, considered all of this and, and had some very sound legal reasoning for letting it in. And so we're confident on appeal. That's just the process. And we'll follow it until its conclusion. While the appeal makes its way through South Carolina's judicial system, the question remains for Buster and those who still believe in Alec Murdoch's innocence. If not Alec, then who did pull the trigger? I do not know who killed Maggie and Paul. I wish I did. I believe the answer lies in the drug world that Alex was financing, but I don't know the answer. Well, the killer is walking around out there somewhere, and I know it ain't Alex. There's a possibility he might would know who done it, because we had a lot of rumors going around that had to do with the boat accident, and then the other rumor was to do with the drugs, but I can't prove none of it. I think it was somebody that wanted to hurt my brother. And it was carried out, at least that's where my mind was then, and, and, and it still is. In the aftermath of Alex's trial and conviction. There is no respite for his only living son. I'm concerned about Buster. I have been concerned about Buster since all of this started. He's been presented in a way that's remarkably unfair. Buster's had his own demons to live with and his own accusations and rumors to live with. The most damaging, a rumor of his involvement in the death of a high school acquaintance, 19-year-old Stephen Smith. A classmate of Alex Murdaugh's older son, Buster, was found dead in the middle of a South Carolina road on July 8th, 2015. Smith's body is discovered approximately 15 miles from Moselle, and his death is ruled a hit and run accident. The case was reopened in June of 2021 based on information brought to life during the investigation into Maggie and Paul Murdaugh's murders. The death of Stephen Smith is now considered a homicide. Stephen Smith is a young man who was killed in 2015. His body was found in the middle of the road. As that investigation was launched, rumors of a connection between Smith's death and Alex's son Buster have popped up. A lot of people in town have come right out and said, oh, you know, Buster was in a gay relationship with Stephen, Buster was secretly gay, all sorts of things. And they really have no proof at all. His sister said someone approached her and said that you and Stephen were romantically involved. His brother says that someone approached him and says that you were with a group of young men who beat him with a baseball bat. What do you say to that? To both of those? A a absolutely. Baseless rumors. I unequivocally deny anything that you just read off of that piece of paper. 
I did not have any personal intimate relations with Stephen and that obviously cannot be proven because it is baseless. I never had anything to do with his murder and I never had anything to do with him on a physical level of, of any regard. Where were you the night that Stephen Smith was killed? The night Stephen was killed, I was at our Edisto Beach House. With your family? With my mom and my brother. Given everything you're going through, what did you feel like when you heard that this thing was surfacing again? Well, it's a lot like this, and, and you know, I, I, I don't want to be rude here, but have you ever been accused of murdering somebody? No. Well, let me tell you, this is very, 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 it, it's a terrible thing to place on somebody with absolutely no fact. I mean, it has harmed my reputation. I mean, people perceive me as a murderer. There's no evidence to any involvement of Buster Murdoch or any Murdoch in the death of Stephen Smith. In one documentary, they are recreating the night of Stephen Smith's murder, and they have a bunch of frat boys and trucks with baseball bets. They don't have any proof of this. This story, like so many today, has become more about what might have happened or what people think happened or what people say happened as opposed to the truth. Those who know, know. And those who don't know, they just make stuff up. It's slanderous, it's defamatory, there's no evidence there, there's no there there. I hope the Smith family finds answers if they can, but the answer is not Buster Murdoch, and promise you that. But in that is still a case that a lot of people are still very interested in. And obviously we can't comment beyond that, but I will say that our office will continue to pursue the truth at every corner. I think that the Murdoch family that is left will try to do everything they can do to bring back a fondness for the name. But is it tarnished forever? I do believe so. Alec tainted his own legacy. He didn't damage the family name. You can only destroy what belongs to you. And the Murdoch name, it belongs to the whole family. Knuckleheads, here goes your chance at redemption. It feels like anybody that maintains the last name Murdoch now has some, you know, horrible stain on their integrity. Because there's obviously a perception, you know, people think like, oh, the apple doesn't fall very far from the tree. Do you ever worry, you know, am I like dad? No, I do not worry because I am not a thief. I am not a, a liar. I'm not a manipulator. In those regards, I am nothing like him. But in other regards, I believe that I do hold some of his more admirable traits, which I am quite proud of. And your mom, what do you think she would say to you about moving on? Well, my hope is that she would be proud of the way that I am handling these situations and the way that I am, am, am carrying out my life. Obviously, I have to live my life now with 100% of my immediate family no longer around me. What? How you gonna get a blue marlin one day? <laughs> Did you get hurt? Uh, a little bit. But what I do have are the fantastic memories. Same story, different day, folks. And things that I was able to do with them while they were here that I try to run in a little bit of a reel in my head constantly. And holding on to that is what gets me through the, the, the tough days. The tragedy of the murders of Maggie and Paul go beyond the Murdoch family, beyond the grounds of Moselle. It spills over to the Low Country, the Beach and Satterfield families, and so many others. The murder trial may have lasted just six weeks, but the ripple effect it created endures. What this incredibly dramatic fall of the House of Murdoch has also meant is the Low Country has become famous, and it will be for quite some time. I would have to say a point of personal pride 
would be the number of people who came up to me after the trial who said, you and your team restored my faith. You renewed my faith in the criminal justice system. I had completely lost faith that someone like Alec Murdoch could be held accountable. There was a lot of relief that we had managed to get the, such an uphill battle, but to get uh, justice for Maggie and Paul, that was really the feeling that struck me the most. Alex Murdoch, guilty of murder. Apparently, of his wife, Maggie. millions of people watch this thing cover to cover. Of course, the remaining question is if he didn't do it, who did? A number of people that stopped me say, I think he didn't do it. Um, a woman from Canada yesterday stopped me, talked to me about it, said, He didn't do it. Y'all did a great job. You'll win it on appeal. I thought a lot about what reasonable doubt means in this trial because there's no direct evidence. It's complicated. And to me, I feel like if I were on the jury, I would find that there's reasonable doubt. I honestly don't know if he murdered Maggie and Paul, but I think he could have done it. But like, if forced to answer, I would say, no, I don't think he did it. Do we know really what happened that night? No. No, we don't. And I doubt we ever will. But if I were a betting person, I'd say there may be at least one more twist or one more turn in the Murdoch saga. All right, so let's talk about Buster 2024, 2025, and beyond. Mm -hmm. What are your plans for the future? My plans for the future are to live a very, very happy life with happy people around me and hopefully get to a place where I can go out and enjoy myself without having to be perceived as a character in this Murdoch story. Thank you, I'm gonna step down. <laughs>